Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Tom Bever, and I'm going to give a short presentation of uh, how we are working towards creating an undergraduate program in consciousness studies at the uh, University of Arizona. Uh, we um, know, we capitalize on the fact that everybody seems to know uh, what consciousness is, at least they can identify it when they see it, even if they can't tell you what it really is. So the uh, Center for Consciousness Studies, that is the organizing sponsor of this conference, received a donation from Eugene Zhang to help us create an undergraduate program. And the first event of that was a course that we created uh, for last spring, a small seminar uh, for about 20 students uh, about consciousness studies. And uh, to populate it, uh, we attracted a number of uh, local faculty and some emeritus uh, faculty uh, from a wide range of disciplines where each of them uh, felt that he or she had a particular perspective on how his or her discipline could contribute to our understanding of consciousness as a scientific object. And of course, the person who uh, we counted on, who was the only person we could find who had some general ideas about uh, consciousness uh, that are fully developed, was Stuart Hameroff, who is, as you know, centrally involved in organizing the conference. Um, so we proceeded. Uh, 20 of the undergraduates who simply signed up without really seeing much as to what we were going to do, because ahead of time we were not entirely sure ourselves, but 20 undergraduates uh, signed up, roughly equally distributed between freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, four or five of each actually. And 12 faculty uh, were interested in each presenting a full two to three hour seminar uh, just with the students uh, to discuss what their particular discipline might tell us about consciousness and how to study it. The students were given readings ahead of time and also then sent in questions ahead of time with comments uh, to help guide the uh, upcoming presenter as to what he or she might want to focus on. When the classes actually ran, I actually left the room uh, because I didn't want the presenter, a co-faculty member with me, uh, to spend any time trying to communicate with me, uh, but rather to be able to focus entirely on communicating with the students, and also uh, so that the students would not feel, if they were going to feel, uh, at all inhibited by my presence. Uh, so uh, we ran it as a seminar in the evening, kind of like the, the classic symposium uh, with some food uh, to go with that, uh, but unfortunately no wine. The range of invited presenters was quite broad. I'll just list them by general area. One was a general theorist of consciousness science. Uh, we had a presentation by a former head of the psychology department who is also a clinician and now is a sensei uh, at various Buddhist centers. Uh, we have a, a Native American uh, who discussed Navajo and Native American worldviews and ideas about consciousness. We have two experts on the inculcation and study of mindfulness with uh, related issues in what the underpinning uh, neurophysiologically is and the philosopher who discussed the nature of perceptual representations as the basis for consciousness, a computer scientist who was interested in and discussed uh, issues relating to the potential for artificial intelligence and consciousness. He was rather doubtful about that. Uh, we have an ethologist who works here actually in our anthropology department whose specialty is cognition and consciousness and related things in animals. A great deal of his research is on dogs. Uh, we have a researcher whose specialty is, as a clinician, interpreting but also understanding the basic mechanisms uh, involved in dreams and the dream state. Uh, we have a, a linguist who is extremely senior, in fact, the leading linguist of the day. 
who also uh, has some ideas about consciousness in relation to cognitive science, um, an active researcher on uh, issues involving the relationship between unconscious and conscious events, and how we're aware of them, uh, a, a psychologist who studies the relationship between memory and how we remember things about ourselves in order to build up the self concept. Finally, a renowned philosopher who was actually emeritus, uh, who discussed issues related to the art problem. So the course plan uh, included, uh, to get things started, two demonstrations by me. My own area of research is language sciences and cognitive science. And I picked on two demonstrations uh, to uh, make the uh, class understand that there is some deep science that's potentially involved in understanding how the mind works, but there are also phenomena uh, that we can be aware of consciously and rather in our everyday life uh, that remind us that there are some really deep mysteries worth trying to understand in consciousness, about consciousness, and that there's some hope actually that with the tools we have, we might actually understand it. So one was an example of um, how complex the underlying computations are uh, that are involved in simply understanding or speaking a sentence. And I'll give you a demonstration of that. Uh, the other example is how we go about uh, reconstructing what a speaker we think said or intended to say, although we hear it as the speaker actually having said it, when in many cases in normal conversation or even normal speech, uh, the way I'm talking right now, a great deal of what you hear me say, I didn't actually say. You are reconstructing it, and the interesting thing is that sometimes you're reconstructing it based on information that comes in later uh, in what I'm saying rather than at the time that you then back up, uh, at least phenomenologically, and reconstruct it. And I'll give you an example of that. So first, what happens in the mind when we actually do something as every day as understand a sentence? Well, the question is from the standpoint of linguistics and language science, what is inside a sentence? What is the structural organization of a sentence that makes it a sentence that actually communicates propositional meanings, not just isolated words or very uh, simple, uh, blunt, uh, uh, single word statements? The answer is syntax, which I'm sure many of you know or are familiar with as a concept, that involves, among other things, uh, structured hierarchies. You can think of it as phrases, uh, but that uh, these phrases are, you'll see, very complexly structured and constrained. Um, and what I'm going to play you is a model of just what goes on in uh, the construction, internal construction, uh, when a, an individual sentence is understood and the structure is assigned to it. This is provided by a former student of mine, Monse Sands, uh, who is now a professor in Kobe, uh, Japan. So uh, she uh, constructed a model, a, a depiction of the different stages of assigning a structure to a sentence. And it involves a number of different processes and operations. So she gave each one a particular characteristic sound so that when you see them all operating in sequence and you hear them all operating in sequence, you get a picture of how things are built up. So one of the primary uh, processes is to take two words or two phrases as the case may be and build a phrase or a larger phrase. And that's the sound she has with that. Uh, you can bring in additional words uh, or actual semantic features or some kind of syntactic functional elements. That's the sound for that. Uh, you can make sure that the things that you put together actually compute in, in a structurally related way, uh, checking that it caches out, so to speak. And then uh, these units, these hierarchically organized phrases, uh, can be moved around. And so that's the sound of preparing and moving a uh, phrase around. So here's a simple sentence. Uh, the boy arrived uh, in Spanish. Um, it's going to be presented to you sequentially as fast as PowerPoint can do it. 
But of course, in real life, it goes presumably much, much faster, so fast that we're entirely unaware of it, certainly. Um, so it starts with a configuration of the words and some of the structural information relevant to the words for that simple sentence, the boy arrived. And here it goes. So that's the structure, and that's the pronunciation of that word after all of that computational work. Now, this model may be wrong uh, in detail. I'm sure it is wrong in detail. It's the latest analysis that we have available within uh, from linguistic science, uh, and it represents a great deal of progress over the last 50 years, but no doubt uh, there will be changes. But the point is that some model like this has to be at issue uh, that uh, puts together words and obeys various kinds of constraints, all of which we are totally unconscious of. So here's an example of a lot of mental work that gets carried out, and we have no idea of how to access it internally directly in our own intuition. We only know the result, and we know about it at all because of the science. Uh, that explores it, just as in the case of many other sciences. The second example that I gave the students to get them oriented towards the general problem of consciousness science uh, is uh, from everyday experience. And in this case, the everyday experience is uh, what happens when you understand normally uh, uttered conversation in the kind of way that I'm talking right now. Uh, and one of the interesting phenomena that we came across, really quite by accident initially, uh, is that in some cases, you put together, the listener puts together information that comes later in a sentence with uh, auditory information that came earlier. And the important feature of it that really is quite striking and still quite baffling is that listeners think that they assigned the word structure and some aspects of the meaning simultaneously with the initial bit of acoustics uh, that they were presented with all at the same time. But we know that that isn't always true, and I'll give you a demonstration of that. What it leaves us with is two ideas, two, two alternatives, probably more alternatives, but I articulate two of them. One is that consciousness, phenomenologically, is retrospective. And there are various theories that, as you know, uh, that um, discuss that as a concept. The other more intriguing, probably less likely to be true, but much more important if true, is that these kinds of phenomena of backwards uh, influence on something that came early uh, without any awareness that that's the case, uh, is that uh, miniature, what we'll call them, time reversals, whatever the mechanism would be, of course, is left open. But the notion that uh, momentarily, so to speak, uh, uh, the me our mental life involves uh, time reversals. And then, of course, if we can back that up uh, with some other kinds of studies, then the question is what the possible mechanism of that might be. This woke the class up, for sure. Um, and what it woke them up to is what I wanted, namely that in understanding consciousness, we actually can refer to everyday phenomena. Uh, that uh, are actually tractable. Uh, in the case of language, we have a rich theory that I gave you examples of in the first demonstration. Uh, and so we have tools with which we can actually manipulate and study uh, what it is that controls this kind of phenomenon. And that's what we're doing uh, in my laboratory, but I won't go through that here. Maybe at the next uh, conference, I'll have some empirical results that are worth talking about. So uh, here's the example, a demonstration of this, pointing out that in ordinary speech, what you hear as fully articulated words, often, in fact, when you analyze the acoustics carefully, you see the words weren't really there. So here's some examples. Here's a snippet of a conversation in which uh, two uh, undergraduates are talking with each other. Uh, the experimenter, my colleague, uh, Natasha Warner at the University of Arizona records these conversations and studies certain aspects 
of how the syntax uh, of their conversation is influenced by the uh, interaction. Uh, what I was interested in simply was the nature of the acoustics in the conversation itself. So here's a snippet uh, from uh, one of the uh, speakers, uh, just a little bit of sound that I clipped out. Got it. Okay, I'm going to play it a couple of times, uh, make it as loud as possible. Got it. Got it. Okay, think about what that is. That actually is four syllables. It's acoustics that's carrying enough information for four syllables uh, and arguably two words, or you could argue it's, it's four words, depending on how you analyze it. I'll play it once more. That's it. Okay, now here's the larger context from which it, which it comes. Let me just make sure it's loud enough. Okay, so here's the larger context. But either way, there's, I mean, I can't register in person, so they're just going to have to deal with that. Okay, I'll play it again, and I'll try to point when uh, that particular segment is actually being uttered. But either way, there's, I mean, I can't register in person, so they're just going to have to deal with that. Okay, right there, right there is where it is. I'll play it once but either more. Either way, there's, I mean, I can't register in person, so they're just going to have to deal with that. Okay, uh, you can guess what it is. Uh, but I'm not going to tell you yet. Uh, uh, well, maybe I will. I'll, I'll do it once more. But either way, there's... Oops. I mean, I can't register in person, so they're just going to have to deal with that. Okay, it's going to have to. It's going to have to. But that's the phrase. That this little bit of acoustics is actually carrying that you reconstruct as a function of hearing it in the context of an entire uh, utterance. I'll play it once more. But either way, there's, I mean, I can't register in person, so they're just going to have to deal with that. So gnafta, it's like that, gnafta, all sort of uh, compressed. And when you hear it in isolation, it just sounds like this. Uh, and what this shows you is that some kind of massive uh, reconstruction of this little bit of acoustic cues in relation to other parts of the, what's going on in the utterance the information in the utterance, are automatically used to decode an acoustic representation that you uh, interpret that isn't there acoustically directly in the input. What's there is some cues and then a combination of those cues with other parts of the utterance. Here's another example of this. Oops, making sure it's loud enough. Okay. Sean. Turn Okay, if you can make any guesses that you like, uh, uh, that's fine. And now I'll play you the entire uh, sentence that it comes from. Or uh, Tuesday night, I'll marry Sean in the spa, but... I'll play it once more, and I'll mark where the particular phrase is. Or uh, Tuesday night, I'll marry Sean in the spa, but... Okay, and now I'll tell you what it is. It's or, uh, Tuesday night, once more. I'll marry Chonin in the spa, but... So this is a little bit here Chonin. is chillin' in them. Chillin' in them. Okay, chillin' in the... Chillin' in the four syllables. Uh, again, compressed and with certain aspects Chonin. of the sound missing. But as soon as it's in the context... Or, uh, Tuesday night, I'll marry Chonin in the spa, but... Uh, uh, at least for native speakers, it immediately falls in plus, place. I emphasize that because a lot of this, of course, calls on overlearned habits uh, that you develop as a native speaker over years of uh, listening to language. Now, these examples that I just played, this, this is the, simply a, a text for it, they're going to have to, uh, and uh, chilling in the, uh, these are examples where there is following um, uh, text, there's following and preceding text. And the important point is that there is, there is preceding text. So you might think... But either way, there's, I mean, I can't register in person, so they're just going to have to deal with that. So there's a lot of pre you know, they can't register in person, so they're just going to, and then you're going to have to, then you get there. So you've got a lot of preceding context. And maybe you might think that, okay, what's going on is it builds up a certain expectation of what you're going to hear, and then you don't need the full 
all the accused in order to reinterpret it as something as the utterance that was intended by the speaker. Similarly here, or uh, Tuesday night uh, when we were shown in the spa, but. Okay, not much preceding context, but it's Tuesday night when we were, and then chilling in the, in this particular case, I think that what follows is much more important. And actually we study, studied that a little bit, uh, that if you just present what follows and in uh, chilling in the spa, uh, that actually that's sufficient all by itself. Or uh, Tuesday night uh, when we were chilling in the spa, but. Uh, to that, the, the, in the spa is uh, all by itself sufficient to actually clarify the chilling in them. Uh, but here's an example where it's more explicit that there can be backwards processing. Uh, in other words, where later information actually clarifies the earlier part of an acoustic signal. Uh, so here's um, a piece of an utterance. That's also four words, by the way. Unfortunately, I think that uh, PowerPoint tends to speed it up when I repeat it, but try again. Oops. Now it's disappeared, just a minute. Ah, that's why. Okay, try once more. Okay, here's the full utterance. And notice that what I just played you is the beginning of the utterance. Uh, now you'll hear a, a fuller sentence with that little bit that I played you, plus what follows it. I just lost the cursor, there we are. Okay, here we go again. Do you have time to talk to me for a little while? Okay, again. Do you have time to talk to me for a little while? So it's, do you have time? Do you have time? But of course, it's not all spelled out. It's, it's this little bit. Oops, that's really too little. Well, uh, as I said, the, uh, the system is playing it too fast now. Uh, I'll play it again with the, with the context. Do you have time to talk to me for a little while? Okay, so the point is here that the you really don't know what that is in isolation. You can't have yet analyzed it as do you have time went just based on that little bit of acoustics. That happens when you get the further information that uh, puts it in a following context. Do you have time to talk to me for a little while? Okay, and that's the important point, the, the, this very interesting phenomenon that is pretty common. It, I picked out some particular examples, uh, but as we've been working on it more and more, uh, we see that it's not at all uncommon for information that comes in later, be it acoustic or semantic or syntactic, uh, can play an important role, a critical role, in clarifying what some bit of prior acoustic input actually was intended to be by the speaker. And as I've emphasized again and again, the important thing is that listeners are just not aware uh, that actually there's this retrospective process going on that clarifies something earlier that they could not actually possibly have decoded at the time, even though the phenomenology of it all is that they did. And so this is, as I said, an example of what we can intuitively call backward processing that escapes awareness, uh, awareness that there's backward processing. And that's a very interesting puzzle. And as I said at the introductory, in the introduction of this particular demo, it leaves us with some possibilities and many possibilities, but the one that I emphasized for the class uh, included that consciousness is reconstructive, uh, that we're a little bit behind uh, in our phenomenology sometimes, uh, which makes one wonder why there aren't more car crashes if it's true, uh, but it is a position that a number of distinguished uh, theorists hold anyway. And then there, as I said, the more daring idea uh, that there, uh, what's at issue here is some kind of uh, warm, uh, not a nano uh, second event that occurs in supercooled laboratories, but a warm temperature miniature time reversal, raising a lot of interesting questions. Once we do more behavioral 
and phenomenological research to really nail it down as to what the parameters are that control it. And as I said, that's what we're working on. Anyway, this woke up the class as I wanted it to, uh, to the idea that consciousness is something that is part of everyday life. Everybody sort of believes that. But here's an example of an aspect of it that is very ordinary, uh, but that nonetheless, once you look into it with a little bit of more detail and a few analytic techniques, uh, you realize that there's a big mystery here uh, and that it's definitely shows us that there's a big problem if we didn't know that anyway. Uh, and, but that in this case, we've got a handle on at least a small part of the big problem. So the course went on. Individual presenters attended and gave their own spiels. Uh, and uh, the students gradually caught on. Uh, and uh, this is a course that met once a week for two to three hours, as I said. Uh, and the presenters really liked the format. They liked the fact that they were all alone uh, with just the students, and the students liked that too. Uh, and um, uh, the course uh, went on for about half of the term. Then uh, suddenly, as we all know, and the entire world has experienced, uh, COVID-19 fell upon us. Uh, and uh, really uh, had a big impact in many ways. So the class continued, but uh, the university closed the campus, and so the class continued online uh, and with Zoom, uh, and uh, presenters adapted to this, and so did the students. And it did cut into some of the uh, dynamic of the uh, class. Students were just beginning to get to sort of know each other's style, and it was becoming more interactive at a personal level, and the Zoom method kind of interrupted that, uh, and that raises some questions about how to work with Zoom in the future, because it's likely to be in our future. Uh, but they adapted, and there is some uh, reason to be encouraged that uh, this general kind of format, uh, we will learn how to manage so that it works well, even in a seminar setting. But as I have to point out, in this case, not just no pizza, not, not just no wine, but also no pizza. At least whatever they had at home, but we didn't take charge of that. So by the end of the presentations and the end of the uh, term, the major assignment that students had, aside from reading, doing the readings before each presenter and submitting some questions, uh, the real assignment was to, we had hoped, to attend uh, one or more plenary sessions of the upcoming uh, uh, the Science of uh, Consciousness conference that was slated to uh, occur last April. But because of the COVID, it did not. And so fortunately, uh, many, many years of prior uh, conferences are available on the website for the center. And so their job was to pick a plenary uh, with all of the videos and discussion that followed the videos and to make a report on it for the class uh, along with uh, any commentaries or questions or criticisms uh, that they had of it. Uh, and uh, I want to remind you again before I give you a few examples uh, that uh, these students uh, were freshmen and seniors, freshmen all the way to seniors. And uh, a couple of examples that I'm going to present you with represent a freshman, a junior, and a senior. And I'm not going to tell you which one is which, because I don't think you could tell, actually. You might actually make it the wrong guess. Uh, so some of the presentations were really quite impressive. They all were good. Uh, but some were really impressive. And they all indicated that the, the students had really grasped uh, the level of excitement uh, that the study of consciousness as a science can uh, create. Uh, so here are just a couple of the presentations. All I can present you with is the actual slides that they presented, not the talk uh, that they gave with it, because uh, that was sort of free form. And in fact, probably unfortunately, uh, we didn't actually record it. Uh, so all we have left uh, behind is the slides. So here's uh, one of the 
<coughs> presentations of one of the plenaries. I don't remember from which year on uh, evolution of life and consciousness, a sort of perennial topic that comes up from year to year. I haven't given you the last name of the students just for caution, uh, because they didn't, <clears throat> they actually agreed to have them presented in places, but I decided best not to uh, involve any privacy issues. And so this uh, particular plen plenary involved presentations by Rasmussen, Kaufman, Walker, and Damer. Uh, and the student summarized the points of view of each of them, and then actually extracted more detailed information and a little bit of personal presentation and a summary of some of the main ideas of each uh, and uh, how it all fit together in different particular theories <coughs> individually. Uh, and I'm not going to recreate the text that went with this, uh, in part because I can't do it all without going back and doing a little more reminding myself, uh, and in part because it's just there isn't time for that. But this gives you a pastiche of how they approached it. This is just one student, remember, presenting all of this stuff uh, uh, with respect to many aspects that were discussed in the plenary, uh, and the three different uh, speakers and their different approaches to the problem at hand. Uh, and um, I think there was a conclusion eventually, uh, and this was some of the questions that arose from Damer's response uh, presentation. And then finally, uh, I think this particular person was most impressed by Bruce Damer's presentation, or it was at least the easiest to talk about. Uh, but uh, the uh, overall uh, uh, summary included a summary of what the ideas were of each of the three main presenters but with a, some degree of sophistication. It wasn't just like a, a normal book report or something. Another example, um, oh, and this was the references that the person referred to, because they did do some extra reading to go with the plenaries. Uh, this is a, another presentation by people well known to many of you, uh, uh, by Felix, unknown last name, uh, who managed to capture some of the scientific content, but also the style of the speakers. So here is an example of how Roger uh, creates um, demonstrations uh, and diagrams for uh, his talks that many of us have experienced. Uh, and um, <clears throat> Felix managed to capture the, the kernel of the ideas and how they went together with some of the uh, related associations. Uh, he, uh, another speaker in that thing was a particular plenary was George Ellis uh, with a uh, sort of a multiple feedback model of um, uh, the basis for what's evolved into uh, what we think of as higher level consciousness uh, and um, some of the uh, associated ideas. And the last one is from Anirban, uh, whose last name I will not attempt to pronounce, uh, but there it is, no, again, known to many of you. Uh, and uh, uh, Felix really, uh, I think, did a very good job uh, capturing the essence of Anirban's ideas, uh, which end up with this model of the brain, uh, which, interestingly enough, uh, is multiples of 12, uh, is the key in this kind of model from Anirban, uh, going back to this sort of analysis. Uh, and uh, Felix managed to capture that, especially in his spoken presentation. Uh, and he had some questions and quibbles and problems, but I didn't include them here. And the last one, I'm just going to show you the beginning and the end of, uh, just uh, to show that some of the students really threw themselves into the project. Uh, this was an Alicia's topic was psychedelics, uh, and she certainly went to town on it uh, with capturing what various of the uh, people in the plenary were saying, uh, Robin Harris, uh, among others, and uh, several others. That, oops, wait, I missed it. Where is it? 
here we are. Uh, various of the other presenters uh, also uh, whose ideas uh, she captured. Uh, but I haven't given you all of the intermediate stuff which actually, where she actually uh, uh, represented and presented uh, some of the scientific underpinning of what was being claimed. Um, oh, and by the way, you might think that this must have been the freshman. Think again. So, uh, how did the students like the class? Very simple. Uh, I did uh, send around a survey. I asked them to criticize the class, and I asked them to say what they liked about it and their overall assessment. Uh, and they knew enough about, to me, about me to know that their grade, which is going to be an A anyway, in all cases, uh, was not going to be dependent on whatever they said. And of course it wasn't. And I did get a few criticisms of various kinds. Um, but we got responses like this. I mean, it, it really, for many of the students, it was a unique kind of seminar, uh, partly because there were so many rather well-known and very active uh, scholars uh, with different points of view, but all attempting to converge on issues relating to how to study consciousness. Uh, and uh, they commented on how much they liked the uh, variety, but also the fact that they could go into some depth. Uh, with each of them, here's just an encomium, which I couldn't resist including. But uh, some, you know, some of the comments were I mean, these are undergraduates, and they they speak their mind. Uh, so I, we also got this comment. Uh, this was sort of like uh, saying that our behavior, our deportment was very good. So this kid thought the course was structured pretty well, as he said. Uh, he did very well in the course, too. But uh, this was the kind of content, kind of comment we got. Others wanted there to be more interaction of certain kinds. Uh, and uh, it was that kind of criticism. Uh, but in general, there was uh, happiness with the course overall and recognition that it was really unusual uh, with respect to what they usually get exposed to. And in fact, they knew, I told them, that we are in the progress, in the process of uh, trying to create an undergraduate program, probably would start as an undergraduate minor because that's easier to get through the bureaucracy and easier for us to figure out how to recruit existing courses on campus and what kind of uh, special courses need to be added. But at least half the class volunteered that uh, if we get it going in time for them, uh, they would really like to have that be their minor, uh, which is a good sign. So that's where we are. Uh, we're now building on this uh, with ongoing outside support um, to really, take this as a kernel event, but now to enfold it uh, within a more organized series of course, set of courses that students can choose from uh, to construct what the university will recognize as a minor. And there are various issues that have to be dealt with that I'm sure many of you know about, especially in a field that's sometimes considered unconventional like this. Uh, there's a bunch of bureaucracy that has to be dealt with simply to create a minor in the modern world to create, to make sure that various constituencies that exist, that think they have some proprietary interests in some of the areas that we would be teaching, that their interests uh, will be respected, that they will be brought in as part of the program, which we want anyway. Uh, and so on. But there's a lot of stuff that has to be done and committees uh, that have to be satisfied. Uh, leading with, with what we're thinking of, of course, leading towards capitalizing on some, in, uh, some existing courses, uh, but creating or continuing with the kind of course that I just described, perhaps as the capstone or perhaps as the introductory course, because uh, it seems to me that it works either way, or this one did. Uh, so maybe that would be the introductory course, or maybe we would have a more didactic introductory course. That's what we're exploring at the moment. Uh, we want both uh, kinds of students, uh, students who are eclectic and not necessarily interested in writing an undergraduate essay or thesis or anything like that, uh, so that students who are 
uh, I guess we could call them regular students, that's what I call them here, uh, can uh, enter into the uh, minor, but also for honor students who want to uh, go into depth uh, more uh, as part of their undergraduate training. Our goal is to try to get at least a sketch approved and started uh, for next spring. We'll probably give something like the same course again uh, and maybe one other uh, more on the uh, more didactic review of uh, ideas about consciousness. I hope that we'll have a report as to how we're doing uh, at the next uh, uh, Science of Consciousness conference uh, with uh, the hopes and students who are actually uh, enrolled in the program uh, as we build it further. I'm not sure that we'll take it up to a full undergraduate major. Uh, that'll take more time and also we have to be, have to see if the market will really support that and whether we have the, the resources to support that with talent that we can easily access. The ready availability now of online uh, presence of people from around the world, uh, of course, does help us now consider enriching the kind of course that I talked about for this last spring by bringing in people who are no longer here or never were here, uh, who have important things to say, uh, uh, that who would be interested in a one or two hour Zoom session uh, with bright students uh, over uh, around the world. And so that does give us a lot of opportunities uh, to enrich what we're doing uh, aside from the local faculty that we have access to. So that's the story. Uh, and I hope this is of some interest to others of you. Uh, I was quite startled, really, I have to say, because my own background is uh, not in consciousness studies usually, and I backed my way into it because of some of the phenomena that I, uh, some of the demonstrations uh, that I gave you that made me uh, realize that not only is this an exciting area, but that some of the tools that I know how to use, which are both experimental and theoretical with respect to a, a careful analysis of language structure and how language behavior and language processing works, uh, that with those tools, it may be possible in my own research to make some progress. Uh, but in the course of that, I have discovered that uh, there's a natural constituency, a natural interest uh, amongst undergraduates, and that there's a natural interest among faculty who don't ordinarily uh, get to talk about how their discipline really bears on uh, some of the questions that relate to the larger topic of consciousness. So uh, I hope that uh, this has been of some interest, and I look forward to the discussion uh, not so much of this, but of uh, this presentation, uh, but of the other presentations in the education workshop. Thanks for your attention. Hello, my name is Maria Kasmirli. I'm a philosopher by training, but I've done lots of other things, including working at schools for many years. Today, I'm going to talk to you about teaching philosophy of mind to younger pre-adolescent children. So let's do it. I think it's a very useful thing to, to do to teach younger children philosophy. It can be a preparation uh, for formal study when they're older in high school or university. But it has great value quite apart from that. Children find philosophical questions fascinating and enjoy discussing them. This activity helps them develop all sorts of really useful skills, which set them up for life, really. They learn to think about subjects carefully, to back up their views with reasons and supporting evidence, to listen to others' views with an open mind, and to give and accept constructive criticism in a friendly and helpful manner. 
All of this applies to teaching philosophy of mind too, of course. Children are naturally curious about what the mind is, how it works, whether their pets have got minds and what are these like, whether robots have minds and so on. And they love talking about these topics. However, I think there is a problem in doing philosophy of mind and, in fact, of consciousness with younger children. The problem arises because of the way we do it, or rather, the way I think we should do it. I will explain what this way is and then say why it can be a problem for teaching philosophy of mind. In doing philosophy, the key thing is to get students to develop an open mind, to reflect on their own beliefs, attitudes, assumptions, to look at things from different perspectives, to compare these perspectives with their own, and to think about the advantages and disadvantages. This doesn't necessarily mean that we want them to change their original view. After exploring other perspectives, they may decide that their first view, their original view, was the best after all, and that's fine. But it does mean that they get to consider all the different options and the strengths and weaknesses of their own position. That's the important bit of it. Now, adopting other perspectives isn't easy isn't always easy at least. All our experience has shaped us to take a view and we're naturally inclined to defend and argue for that view and against the view of all the rival positions. So here is where I think imagination comes in. <clears throat> it may not be easy to accept other perspectives but it can be quite easy and a great deal of fun to imagine them. So here's what I do. Instead of describing the philosophical positions in abstract terms, I create little scenarios, little situations for the children to act out. They have to imagine that they're a certain person in a certain situation with a certain problem. These scenarios are so designed that it's natural for the children, for the characters in them, to ad adopt a certain perspective or view, the one I want them to consider. Then I ask the children to act this out with as much feeling and energy as they can, so that they can identify with the characters they are playing. They enjoy this, of course, and I tell them that, you know, I never expect them to have particular uh, reactions or to adopt any particular view. I leave that up to the mechanics of the scenario and the children's imaginations. Then when they've done the exercise, we stop, sit down as ourselves again and reflect on the trip we've had, on the imaginary situation. <clears throat> If it's worked, the children will now bring a new perspective to the discussion than they did before. And I call these the SIR method for the three phases, uh, scenario, identification, and reflection. Now, in many areas, this works really well. Take ethics, for example. It is easy to create everyday, natural kind of situations which present different viewpoints and difficulties and challenge the children's pre-existing intuitions. Using these scenarios can help children appreciate a variety of different perspectives on the same problem. <clears throat> then why do I say that this creates a problem for doing philosophy of mind? After all, philosophers of mind and indeed of consciousness use a lot of imaginative examples. They ask us to imagine what it is like to be a bat, 
to wonder what would happen when Mary leaves her black and white room to conceive a creature that looks and acts just like us but has no consciousness. So you might well think that my method would work just fine with this topic. The problem is that these scenarios are artificial, they're unnatural. When it comes to thinking about the mind, we do not have a sound basis of everyday intuitions to draw on, as we do with other areas of philosophy, as I said, ethics or politics, or even religion. <clears throat> and that is because the mind is a theoretical entity uh, which we conceptualize through metaphors, um, as a computer, say. And the thought experiments we use often serve to create intuitions rather than to test them. In fact, they're often specifically designed to induce a particular impression, to create a particular intuition. They are what Daniel Dennett calls intuition pumps. Imagining what it is like to be a bat is designed to pump the intuition that is something very special and very private uh, about the bat's inner life that science will never be able to capture. Similarly with Mary and the zombies and all the other examples. The computer analogy, of course, goes somewhat the opposite way. Uh, it's designed to pump the intuition that the mind is a machine. These imaginative experiments do the opposite of what I'm trying to do. Instead of opening up new perspectives and challenging existing assumptions, they create a view on a topic that the students may have never thought about and fix that view in the mind of the student as one that is compelling and undeniable. The result of this is that by introducing children to these metaphors, we can end up inadvertently installing there in their heads a certain theory of what the mind is, which they find very hard to criticize or move beyond. In short, the very method that can work to open up kids' minds in other areas, to help them think in a very uh, open-minded way can work to close it down in philosophy of consciousness. What shall we do about this? Should we avoid metaphors and intuition pumps and focus on introducing scientific findings about the mind? I think we should introduce children to science, yes, and I'll explain how I do it in a minute. But that will be very hard for children and perhaps even limiting. And in any case, there are some people who believe that science will never be able to help us understand the mind fully. But apart from that, we need metaphors and analogies. The mind, the brain, is an immensely complex system and it's very hard to understand its operations in detail. For everyday pur purposes, at least, then, we need convenient, user-friendly examples, ways of conceptualizing what our minds are and how they work. Another option would be to say that perhaps we shouldn't try to do philosophy of consciousness with children. Then that way, we wouldn't do any harm. I don't think that's a good idea. Children will encounter ways of thinking about the mind offered by other means, religion, pop psychology, their own imaginations. So they, they'll inevitably come to think about the subject and we want them to have the right tools to do it really well. Here's what I suggest. I propose we use the imagination-based method I recommended, but in a more student-centered way. Instead of presenting children with standard scenarios and thought experiments, we ask them to brainstorm. We ask them to come up with imaginative ways about what the mind is and how it works. 
about what seeing, hearing, feeling, thinking and consciousness are, using as far as possible common everyday language. They may draw pictures, diagrams, suggest comparisons or even propose original uh, scientific theories. It doesn't really matter too much about what their suggestions are. They may even be fanciful. They may wonder uh, if there are little people inside our heads like numbskulls, whether there's a soul that does uh, operates uh, and does everything in my head, whether the mind is like some kind of fanciful clockwork or like a laptop computer. Ch children enjoy this and they come up with all sorts of wonderful ideas and unexpected comparisons. One of my students suggests that the mind is like a factory, which is operating when we're awake and closes down when we go to sleep. He even said that uh, people are, are in a coma because the workers have gone on a strike. As I said, the initial ideas themselves do not matter too much. The important bit comes next. The next step is to get students to reflect and evaluate each other's suggestions. Is this a good image of the mind? What gets what what does it get right? What does it get wrong? Is it misleading? Is it helpful? Is it useful? Of course, the students are still going to draw on their intuitions uh, in the process of assessing suggestions. But we're not pushing those intuitions in any one direction. That's the crucial bit. And more importantly, we're encouraging them to take a critical attitude to, to these metaphors, images, analogies, thought experiments uh, and theories in the area. We want them to realize that it's a matter for discussion, what the right image is, what the right metaphor is, what are the right questions to ask and what options should be considered. In short, we want them not to just imagine different answers to the problems of the mind, but to imagine different conceptions of what the problems are. The final step is to add new information to the mix. This is where I think we can use science. After a round of brainstorming and evaluation, the teacher provides some basic information about the mind drawn from biology, psychology, uh, neuroscience, behavioral science um, and you know things like how do the nerve cells work or how the attention and limits of visual experience work uh, about the overall structure of the mind. The children think about this information and then they have another round of brainstorming and another round followed by another round of evaluation and critical kind of assessment and so on. You repeat this as many times as you need to. So I'm suggesting then that with younger children, we should avoid traditional ex examples and thought experiments and adopt a three-stage process of brainstorming, peer evaluation and information acquisition. The teacher will explain the aim of the process and say that it's to find a useful but very simplified model of an extremely complex system. Then hopefully, when the students later encounter the ideas of professional philosophers, they'll see the connection with what they used to do in their very first philosophy of mind classes. They'll see that philosophers of mind are offering also very simplified models designed to reconcile our everyday intuitions with what the science tells us about the nature of, of us as biological systems. With luck then, our students will come to take a more critical view of the way the problems are framed and thought experiments are used. So instead of asking what is it like to be a bat? They may ask, what can we know about what it is like to be a bat? Instead of asking what Mary learns when she leaves her black and white room, we may focus on what she learns when she's still inside that room. 
And when it comes to hard and easy problems of consciousness, we may ask whether those labels really are the right ones for the problems in question. So that's the theory behind my approach. How do we put it into practice? What sort of materials do we use to stimulate children's imaginations without imposing a particular vision upon them? The original idea was for this to be a live workshop and this would have been the, the, the point where I would have been opening up the session for people to come up with ideas, discussion and um, practical suggestions um, or suggestions for further investigation, really. It's not live, but I would still like to hand it over to you um, and hope I hope that at some point we will be able to have this discussion, albeit in a different form. Thank you very much for listening. Hello, travelers. My name is Alan Combs. I'm at the California Institute of Integral Studies as my day job. Uh, I'm also founder of, or was founder of, the Society for Consciousness Studies, uh, which now has over 200 members who are interested in uh, many aspects of consciousness and consciousness studies. Um, so I have uh, a number of interests in different areas of consciousness studies. And at this point, I'm here to talk a little bit about education uh, and to introduce the other speakers who will uh, either come along and give talks or will be visiting uh, the discussion boards uh, as the week goes by. Uh, these include Maria, uh, from uh, Greece, and uh, we'll check in from Greece, and Thomas uh, Beaver, who is uh, at the University of Arizona, right uh, at the heart of things, and uh, may be stopping in to talk about education as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, education in, uh, about consciousness is a slippery topic, as uh, I'm sure you all know. Um, one of the difficulties with it is it's so hard to define. And though it's, uh, everybody's interested in it, or a lot of people are, but exactly what are they interested in? This reminds me of a book I read when I was a young man called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance uh, by Robert Piercy. Uh, and in that book, uh, Robert Piercy talks a lot about education, working in universities and so on. Uh, and uh, excellence in student performance and excellence in teaching. And one of the points he makes again and again and again is excellence is one of those things we all recognize but we can't define. Uh, we can pretty much, uh, within limits, uh, agree on uh, excellence in art, uh, excellence in writing, we can read student essays, and we know which ones are excellent and which ones are. But to try to define them, that's a whole other issue. So now we're here to talk about uh, education and uh, in particular education about uh, the topic of uh, uh, consciousness. And uh, we have the same problem that it's difficult to define our topic, but uh, in a sense, everybody knows what it is. Uh, that is, we all know uh, when we're talking about consciousness uh, or experience uh, or awareness, uh, or whatever you want to call it, but people define it differently. And so let me just say a couple of words about that. Uh, the most common philosophical definition of consciousness nowadays is what it is like. What is it like? There's a famous article that some of you may have read, uh, probably have read, uh, because it was called What is Like to Be a Bat? And then the distinctions made between a brown bat uh, and a baseball bat, <clears throat> and to say, well, it's probably not like anything to be a baseball bat, but brown bat probably is like something. And if you have a dog or a cat, and you watch the dog and cat and interact with it, you probably uh, are perfectly comfortable with saying it's probably like something to be Roger the dog or Mary the cat. They certainly act like it's something to be them. Uh, they seem to enjoy certain activities and uh, 
uh, shy away from others and have a lot of features in common with human beings. So that's a very basic understanding. And uh, if we're going to teach about consciousness uh, to undergraduates or graduates or anyone else, uh, you need to kind of get clear as to what definition one is, is doing. Uh, I've written a couple of articles about this, in fact, but I didn't bring them along with me today. Uh, but is it something like, is it like something to be a bug, for example? Uh, or is it like something to be a intelligent robot? Um, these are all the kinds of questions that come up around the study of consciousness and, and what it means. Uh, I tend to stick to the very basic idea of what is, what is it like, or what it is like, perhaps you'd say. What is it like to uh, eat a, a chocolate uh, pecan pie with particular taste, particular quality, and so on? Uh, what is it like to eat an apple? Uh, we talk about the taste and so on. But if you get involved in the literature and the writing about it, especially over the last few decades, uh, the word consciousness will have different meanings depending upon the author. And it's, uh, it's important to keep that in mind. So, uh, for instance, if uh, the person's writing from a medical point of view, uh, a physician wants to know if a person has been in a car accident is conscious or unconscious, um, we'll ask questions about what's your name, uh, raise your right hand, uh, what's your street address. This is a uh, uh, real uh, basic uh, consciousness testing, if you will, or uh, if the person is aware uh, of where they are and what their situation is. So that, that's, a, uh, uh, that's a very similar to the notion of being awake. Is this person awake or are they in a coma or are they knocked out? So just being awake is sort of the basic raw business of human consciousness that a physician often will be uh, concerned with. Uh, on the other hand, if you read the neurological literature, uh, actually from a few decades ago particularly, uh, consciousness is uh, stratified into real basic uh, uh, wakefulness of some kind that animals seem to have but uh, what they sometimes call higher level of consciousness, which is they're really talking about self-consciousness. And so when they say an animal is not conscious in the same way a human being is, they mean self-conscious. Is your dog self-conscious? Does he know he's a dog, for example? Uh, is he aware of his situation? Generally, the answer is no. In fact, uh, outside of human beings and perhaps a few advanced mammals, it's unlikely, it seems to me, uh, that other species of the planet Earth are self-conscious. If you're self-conscious, then you worry about things like death, uh, about your own future, and you uh, have a sense of compassion for other people and understand that it's like something to be them, although it would be wrong to say other animals don't have uh, compassion in that sense primates for example uh, understand when others are hurt sometimes take care of them uh, and so on so there are all these different ways of thinking about consciousness and for the most part uh, when i talk and write about consciousness i emphasize what is it what, what's it like to be this person uh, <clears throat> in this situation uh, this species and so on or for a robot or a computer is it like anything to be a computer? Or is it like the baseball bat, except maybe with fancier controls? Uh, and then there's still another level of consciousness, if you will, or way to talk about it. And that's when we get into religious and mystical uh, talk. And so if you're reading Eastern literature uh, or mystical literature, then consciousness uh, is uh, more of a pervasive quality. And if you're a panpsychist, for example, uh, then you uh, view consciousness as a sort of diffuse feature of the cosmos. And some physicists actually do this. Some physicists uh, actually uh, view consciousness as a quality uh, or maybe pre-consciousness, as they sometimes call it, 
uh, that's uh, imbued in uh, all, all of nature in some way or another. So even um, quantum particles uh, that are unpredictable in their behavior are in some sense making choices. So consciousness on that level, if you're a mystic and you feel the universe is uh, rife with consciousness or you experience a broad uh, span of consciousness in nature, that's still a different way to think about consciousness. And uh, it's not personal at that point. Uh, there's a lot of talk today, uh, workshops and uh, training, and what's called non-dual consciousness, which gets even harder to define, but basically it says that I don't experience when I'm in a non-dual state, I don't experience myself as separate from the cosmos around me, so that I'm one with everything. Well, that's really quite different than what neurologists, neurologists talked about for so long, uh, asking the question whether an animal is conscious or not, meaning does it have this uh, metacognitive, if you like, sense of what it's like to be there. All right, I'm going to go to some slides I have uh, and talk about those. So let me pause for a second and I'll be right back. I'm going to move now to uh, some slides and talk about them in terms of uh, different areas that people are interested in consciousness studies and also uh, how those might be used in an educational venue. So bear with me, I'm going to try to share my screen here. I'm not an expert at, uh, at Zoom, so um, if we have some pauses, uh, bear with me. I hope you're seeing that now. Uh, so this is a picture I made of some of the uh, aspects of uh, consciousness studies. It's a very broad area. Uh, I thought about consciousness goes through European philosophy, uh, Eastern thought, uh, psychology, depth psychology, spiritual uh, examination, spiritual realms, anthropology, American philosophy, American pragmatism, and so on. Obviously, uh, modern neurology, physics, and systems theory. So I want to talk about uh, these in a little bit more of an educational uh, sort of venue. So here we go. Uh, here we see a number of aspects of consciousness uh, that makes it so difficult to study. Uh, the, uh, the image of the blind uh, uh, people examining the elephant is uh, uh, typical of the problem of consciousness studies in that uh, we all kind of know what it is, we feel it, we touch it, uh, and yet uh, we don't all agree on what it is. And so these various, this is an old Indian tale, these various uh, blind men uh, examine this elephant <clears throat> and later ask about it. Uh, one says it was a snake, one says it was the side of a mountain, uh, and so on and so forth. So that's sort of the story of uh, consciousness, that uh, it's something that we know about, but we don't know exactly what it is. And it's very hard to pin down in a way that can be studied the way you might study uh, most things in, in uh, physical, natural sciences. Uh, there are many ways people have viewed consciousness, like in different theories. Here's one that shows all the different types of consciousness. Uh, wide awake, asleep, dreaming, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's been studied from many different perspectives, uh, and people have tried to break it down in different ways. Here we see uh, wakefulness, and then there's sleep, dreamless sleep, uh, lucid dreaming, altered states, and so on. So it's very difficult to tie consciousness down and study it in the usual way. You would study something else. This is one of my favorites right here. Uh, so the students are looking at the uh, professor who says, here are these nerve cells, here's consciousness, and uh, here's a, a miracle, or magic as he calls it. Can we see that trick again? So it's a it's a kind of thing that everyone knows 
what it is in some sense. And when we say something like, is our dog or cat conscious, we know perfectly well what we mean by that question. But then when you try to tie it down, it gets very, very difficult. Uh, so as I've often used this metaphor uh, or example from uh, Piercy's book, um, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, in which he talks about ex excellence in education often. Uh, in fact, we all know what excellence is when we see it. It's like excellence in art. We know that too, for the most part. Uh, but what is it? Write it down, write an essay on it. It's very, very difficult. Uh, so there are different ways to view consciousness. One of my favorite uh, is, in fact, an old one from Charles Tart here in which he said there are different elements. So in any state of consciousness uh, or mood, we have these different patterning forces such as humor, uh, sensory input like music or something we might taste, uh, and uh, thought processes that influence the way we see things. So these all uh, form uh, patterns in the mind that structure our experience of consciousness. And then we have disruptive uh, forces as well. If the phone may ring when you're in the middle of trying to meditate, for example. Uh, you may get an upset stomach. Things can happen that are disruptive uh, to any particular state. Charles wrote this whole book called uh, States of Consciousness in which he, he tried to show that uh, uh, each particular state of consciousness is uh, comprised of a number of these different kinds of elements, our thoughts, our feelings, our sense of humor, uh, emotions, sensory input, and, and so on. Okay, so continue to examine some of these different ways to understand consciousness. There's a lot of history we could talk about, and I won't bore you with most of it, uh, but if you study the history of the mind or history of philosophy, uh, one of the interesting things you discover is that consciousness, the way we talk about it today, was practically invented by Rene Descartes in the 1600s. He was the first person to really about, write about consciousness as an inner uh, presence, an inner experience that uh, we can uh, characterize and uh, map out and talk about. Uh, John Locke, the British philosopher, picked up on that almost immediately. Uh, other philosophers, such as George Berkeley, uh, many of you know as an idealist, argued, well, there really isn't anything other than consciousness or experience, you might call it. Uh, anything you look at, no matter what it is, you only know about it through experience or your consciousness. And so how do you know it's really there beyond that? So he was an idealist. He basically argued that everything uh, that we know is conscious experience. Uh, that's a bit extreme, and uh, it's, it's a fairly consistent point of view. If you want to follow it, you can make a good argument for it. But I want to mention that the idea that consciousness is uh, a feature of the mind, of the inner life, uh, was really invented by Descartes. That doesn't mean People before that didn't talk about feeling good or feeling bad, or that they didn't talk about uh, experience in uh, things that were beautiful and not beautiful. But uh, the idea that consciousness was a feature or even a thing in the inner life came with Descartes. And it's created a lot of confusion because uh, like quality, it's nothing you put your finger on, and you can't really find it anywhere. Uh, so there have been a lot of efforts to find where consciousness is at. Is it in the front of the head, back of the head? Is it in the heart? Uh, is it in the whole body? And so on. These are good questions to talk about, as a matter of fact, as an educational kind of puzzle. Where is consciousness? And if, it do, and if we can't localize it or talk about where it is, what sense does it make? to talk about it as if it were something uh, that were somewhere. Uh, we know that most Americans or most Europeans put consciousness in the brain. They'll point to the head if you say, where is consciousness? But uh, uh, then beyond that, you can't really pin it down much. <clears throat> so 
consciousness or experience it seems to be, but be where, be, but where it's being is, is a real puzzle. And we know that different parts of uh, our mind and brain are necessary for consciousness, but does it mean that consciousness is actually there? Uh, I'm reminded of the story of the uh, father who took his son to the baseball game. And when they came home, the son said, well, uh, I saw the pitcher. I saw the pitcher's mound. I saw uh, the, uh, the, the game field. I saw the, the, uh, the banners. But the team spirit, I got, where was the team spirit at anyway? Well, the team spirit is no place that you can localize. And consciousness is a bit like that. And one of the points I want to make over and over again is without this ability to measure and locate consciousness, it's been very hard to bring it into the realm of academic study or any other kind of study, even though it's tremendously widely a matter of interest. Uh, okay, so I'll talk about some areas that we do spend a lot of time with and which are well, well represented in academia, uh, that uh, consciousness virtually permeates. One of them is cognitive psychology. Cognitive psychology is a study of mental processes, really. Uh, here's a good example. Uh, thinking, problem solving, memory. How is memory organized anyway? <clears throat> we don't just, uh, you know, an, an ordinary from moment to moment living, uh, information comes to us as we need it. But if you're really trying to get into memory, uh, for example, if you're a chef, uh, how do you remember all the different kinds of fish and ways to cook fish or shellfish, for example? Or if you're a computer programmer, uh, maybe you're working with a particular program type. Uh, these things aren't all in your mind all the time. You have to get into them. Somebody walks up uh, to you on the street and asks you some difficult question, uh, even in a field that you know a lot about, like language or computer programming, how to cook shellfish, or what kinds of paints are best for particular kinds of uh, uh, work, art, artistic work. You probably can't answer them just instantly. You have to think about it a little and the more you think about it, the more facts come to mind. Uh, I used to notice this when I was a undergraduate teacher and would lecture uh, regularly, is that I would go to class uh, with some topic I wanted to talk about, and I would have a general idea of the topic, and I would have some notes. But uh, the interesting thing was that the longer I, excuse me, the longer I uh, talked about the topic, uh, with students, the, uh, the more facts that would come to mind, that is, it, that as the topic became familiar. So, excuse me, I'm a little trouble with my earphones here. So, in, uh, in fact, uh, as we get immersed in a topic, we enter into a kind of network of memory that uh, is organized somehow. And there are many theories about how memory is organized and what kind of matrix or complex structure uh, memory is all about in the human mind or in any kind of a mind for that matter. Uh, people who do computer programming, of course, have to think a lot about how to organize facts, how to organize the material in the memory uh, and so on. So uh, cognitive psychology, covers quite a few of these kinds of areas. It derives from the view uh, that really became quite popular over 50 years ago, that the human mind is a kind of onboard computer. When people first discovered how powerful information processing can be in a digital computer back in the actually 1940s, they began to say, wait a minute, the human brain is really a, a very complex computer. It's made up of these nerve cells. These nerve cells uh, in, are made up of impulses. Uh, the impulses uh, and uh, patterns of impulses uh, look a lot like uh, digital patterns of activity in a digital computer. And so the idea became very fashionable uh, to think of the brain as a computer 
And along with that, the mind is a computer. And so mental processes become computational processes. And that's basically the basis of cognitive psychology. <clears throat> and so cognitive psychology deals with the same kinds of problems uh, that you would run into doing computer programming, except we're interested in human beings. So we're interested in memory, interested in thought, interested in problem solving, uh, and uh, many kinds of processes related to that. So these are examples of cognitive psychology, an area which uh, is so permeated by consciousness uh, because the system really doesn't work if we're not conscious that uh, it's not separate from consciousness studies at all. Let me just go on to some other areas. Uh, nowadays, uh, we have very fancy computers and very fancy robots running on computers. So one of the interesting issues today is how smart can computers become and how smart can uh, robots become? We have a Philip K. Dick robot here on the upper left. Some of you know that Philip K. Dick was a prominent science fiction writer a few decades back. Uh, and now he's uh, been uh, modeled by a very fancy computer and he will talk to you. He will say, well, uh, Philip, what are you going to do when robots get more intelligent than humans? What are you going to do with those humans? And he says, oh, don't worry, we'll put you in a zoo. We'll put you in a human zoo and uh, we'll take good care of you. So there's this question of what are we going to do if and when robots get smarter and smarter? Will they become uh, like human beings? Will we give them equal status? Or they, will they really just take over and will become secondary? Or how are we going to deal with this? And what about ethical questions? How do you treat a very advanced robot? Most of them right now are still uh, really pretty mechanical down underneath, even though they may look smooth uh, in their behavior. But they're still pretty hardwired in some ways. Uh, but we're looking at a future with uh, computers and robots that get fluid, uh, intelligent, insightful, <clears throat> and how do we consider them? And are they conscious? Just how intelligent does a robot have to become to become conscious? Or does it ever become conscious? I have a uh, little video down here. I'm afraid to turn it on because I had a lot of problems. Uh, this is actually the second time I recorded this talk because somehow I lost the recording when I played uh, these videos in it. So here's Sophia. Sophia is a robot that uh, was designed to look like Audrey Hepburn. Uh, she's pretty intelligent and she'll chat with you. This is my dear friend uh, Ben Gertzel who did most of the designing for Sophia and she will talk to you. She was actually designed for crowd, crowd control in uh, places like Disneyland, but she'll talk to you like very much like a human being. Uh, general intelligence, um, in fact, a organized or uh, AI, organized uh, intelligence or high intelligent computers. So the question is, how do we view a very intelligent computer or Android when they get more and more intelligent? Will they become uh, equal to human beings? Will they become advanced, more than human? Will they be conscious? And that's a real question. Uh, my friend Ben Gertzel here, I asked him, he says, well, I don't know. They get smart enough to think about things the way human beings do. Uh, then uh, whether they're conscious or not is a really difficult question to answer. And they can, if they can answer you, talk to you the way a human would, it's even more complex. So, and, and there's a moral issue about how should we relate to uh, uh, AGI, or artificial general intelligence as it's called, AGI uh, robot. The uh, real issue here is how should we treat them? Do they have the same moral rights we do? Should we give them citizenship uh, and so on? 
some of you who are old Star Trek fans may recall that there was a show, uh, in fact, two shows back in the series, The Next Generation, uh, called The Measure of a Man. The Measure of a Man. And this was uh, the story was that uh, some scientists wanted to take data, you know, who's supposed to be a quantum computer driven uh, character, and assemble him, take him apart and see how he works. Well, it turns out data wasn't real, real excited about this idea. <clears throat> and he wanted to exercise his rights not to be dissembled. So then the question is, did he have any rights? Was he a piece of property that was owned by Starfleet Command? Uh, like a fancy lawnmower or something. Do they have a perfect right to take him apart or did he have the rights of a human being? So there's a whole trial about data uh, in which uh, Picard uh, represents data and uh, uh, someone else uh, is the attorney on the other side. Uh, number one, what was his name? Uh, so th they really discuss the issue of is data intelligent? Is he conscious? Uh, they don't really settle the consciousness question, but they circle around it a lot from the point of view of uh, is he aware of who he is and what he is? So you remember, there are these basic three kinds of views of consciousness. One of them is, is, uh, is like a medical view. Is this person alive? Um, are they aware? Are they awake? It's a real basic consciousness that's used in that for car accident, for example. See if a person is still awake and alive. Uh, the next one is, uh, are they uh, able to think about things, answer questions? Uh, do they sort of know who they are? Uh, so there's this question whether you know who you are or not. That's the next level. And then there's a, a consciousness beyond that in a more spiritual sense in some cases. So uh, the point is that are these robots conscious in the sense of knowing who they are? Or could they be? And uh, the argument about date is that yes, he knows who he is. He knows he's on trial. Uh, he knows he could be the symbol and he's not happy about it. Does that mean, uh, what, what does that mean? So I think a lot of discussion could be centered uh, in educational venues uh, and, and often is around the, the question of can a robot be conscious? What would be required for that? What rights would a robot have? How smart do they have to be to be conscious? Uh, actually, there's a machine, uh, movie called Ex Machina that covers uh, some of this territory too in a kind of a scary way uh, in which one of the characters is a lady who's a robot and uh, yet seems to be very human. So lots of questions about uh, Robots, their rights, do they have feelings, are they conscious? Uh, what if they evolve? How will they relate to human beings? Will they eventually take over? Will they become partners in the, in the world? Or, or as Picard suggests in uh, the Star Trek, are we gonna make slaves out of them all? And are they become, or will they become a, a, a suppressed race? Lots of questions. So that's a good topic for discussion and in the education venue. Clearly, uh, one of the most important areas now in research where consciousness is becoming a really essential part is understanding the brain. There are many, many, many books written and much said about the left and right brain uh, and how they're different, the left brain being more analytic, language oriented, and so on, uh, the right being brain being more emotionally oriented, intuitive. Uh, holistic and thinking and so on. Uh, some very good literature on this and very interesting books and a lot of popular material that's not so good because this became such a fashion in the 70s and then was poo-pooed and now it's coming back again. But there's no, true, no uh, doubt that the left and right brain uh, ordinarily and the average person uh, have this division at least to some extent. Uh, there are exceptions. There are people whose uh, uh, brains in some sense are reversed, the left brain's more intuitive, right brain more analytic, uh, but this does seem to be a general division. 
And we see this division all through the animal world as well, even down to birds, left and right, and uh, that the processing is different. So this is very much related to consciousness. This was uh, one of the first topics actually to come into neurology in terms of consciousness. Is uh, feeling, intuitive, uh, linguistic thought, and so on, and where it's coming from in the brain. We now have images of the brain that are good enough to really uh, talk a little bit about what's going on in different areas. And this picture in the upper left-hand corner is a good one for that because uh, what we see here is activity levels uh, in a normal brain, upper left, vegetative state. That would be somebody that's in a deep coma. Uh, and uh, real question whether they'll live at all uh, or how long they'll be in that coma. Uh, minimally conscious state, lower right, that could be somebody uh, sort of half awake, but also under an anesthetic, uh, pre-surgery, for example. And then on the left, a locked-in syndrome. Now, that's a scary syndrome. It's very, very rare. Uh, but but uh, this person has uh, been in a car accident or a tumor and some of affected the brain. And in this rare condition, uh, locked-in syndrome, people have no control of their body, period. Maybe some eye movement, they have eye movement, uh, and maybe the eyelids. So the question is, is anybody home? There are coma states as well. I mean, coma really vegetative states, much like the one on the upper right. Uh, in which people uh, show some eye movement, for example, but there's just nobody home. So is somebody home? There was a court case a number of decades ago about a lady named uh, Quinlan, Erin Quinlan, and she uh, came home one day from a party, uh, and grad she was a student, came home, went to bed, and never woke up. Uh, fell into a deep coma, and uh, she had a particularly problematic type of coma in that she would, every once in a while, she would kind of appear to wake up. Her eyes would move, she would look this way and that, she would make uh, various sounds like speech, although she didn't really say anything, they weren't really words, uh, but she seemed to be awake. Uh, and uh, it turns out this state is known, it's rare, goes on forever. And uh, so the neurologist wanted to unplug her eventually and let her die. Eventually the parents decided that was the best course, but uh, she happened to be in a Catholic hospital and the nuns didn't uh, believe religiously that they had the right to take a life. So this went on and on and on. And it was a strange court case in which the parents of this poor lady sued in order to get the right to unplug her so she could die. Uh, I don't remember the details. She did eventually die, but it was a long drawn out affair and very sad. And of course, the big issue was, is anybody home? The other issue was, can she ever wake up? Well, in theory, she could. Every once in a while, one in a million uh, or a thousand coma cases will wake up. Uh, that don't seem to be uh, in nobody home, but uh, it's very rare. Uh, so you're going to keep them uh, in a vegetative state for 30 years in the hospital at great expense, and uh, God knows how you feel about the patient. But anyway, uh, now we've got ways to look in the brain and kind of see if there's a conscious person in there. So on the lower left, we have a person uh, with the locked-in syndrome, uh, externally they look like they're in a coma and nobody's home, but we see activity in an area of the brain that indicates conscious awareness. Now, this person may be able to communicate through eye movements as well. Uh, so with this uh, ability, we can track consciousness in semi-waking states, uh, under anesthetics, to see how deep an anesthetic needs to be or whether a person is really conscious or not, uh, and so on. So this is a very recent breakthrough, and it's, uh, I think it's a very interesting uh, sort of thing. <clears throat> As we can see in the diagram underneath uh, that uh, we really are now starting to get some very detailed 
images of the brain. Now, in some ways, these are uh, a little deceptive because, or at least uh, it's suggesting that we know more than we do. We do have this uh, incredible anatomical knowledge of the brain, but we still don't know how consciousness is connected to the brain. Whether the brain just produces it, uh, there are neurologists that say uh, produces uh, uh, consciousness, the brain produces consciousness, the way the mouth produces saliva. It just, uh, it's just a production process, and we just don't know the details. Uh, but as we'll see, there are other uh, people that point out uh, that in uh, some states, like near-death experiences, or out-of-the-body experiences, it seems like consciousness has a life of its own sometimes. So this is all worth discussing, and there's a great deal of literature, a great deal of material that can be read about the brain, about the brain and the mind, about the brain and consciousness. And while it is not all quality material, a lot of it is. So there's good stuff, and uh, there's even a couple of brain coloring books, and I, I use one of them in one of my courses, because if you look at a diagram of the brain like that, it's really hard to remember it all and do much with it. But if you get one of these brain coloring books, sort of work through the coloring process, uh, it's surprising how much you can learn. Okay, move on here. There's a lot of talk today, and it's very interesting, although uh, it's very technical, about how the brain might be related and thought as well uh, to consciousness processes. So uh, how is consciousness related to the brain at all? This is a point I just brought up and we'll get back to it again. Uh, is consciousness really a product of the brain? By the way, blood is a product of some of the uh, systems in the human body. But uh, quantum theory and events at the quantum level seem to have uh, some strange similarities to thought processes and experiential processes. So, uh, in fact, Stuart Hameroff, who's the organizer of this conference, as a matter of fact, uh, many of you know, has worked at, at length over the years with Roger Penrose, Nobel laureate in mathematics and writes a lot in physics. Uh, the, the two of them have developed a theory of consciousness based on the idea that consciousness emerges at the finest level of the nervous system. Microtubules, which are among the smallest uh, micro micro structures that run all through the brain, these tubulin or tubulin uh, the tubes uh, made out of what are called tubulin dimers. These are uh, protein molecules that have quantum features. Now, quantum reality has some interesting parallels to consciousness itself. And so uh, it, their argument is that what goes on in the brain that relates to consciousness is way down at these microtubule levels uh, and that what goes on at the microtubule levels are quantum processes. And, and an example of quantum processes is that you can have uh, objects, uh, quantum type objects, that are separate from each other in physical space, but combine to produce a, a more fundamentally unified event. Uh, this is sort of represented by the singlet state up in the upper left-hand corner. But now consider what happens if you look at your dog or your cat. Your cat, for example, is represented in a variety of areas of the brain. Uh, the visual area where you see the cat, uh, if the cat makes any sounds, in the auditory area, which is more or less different than the visual area. The shape of the cat, the movement of the cat, uh, these are all represented and tracked by different parts of the brain. Uh, and uh, But yet we have a single experience of the cat. So our experience, conscious experience, tends to be unified. We see, we see a single cat, we hear it, we smell it, we see it. Uh, we can tell its shape, its color, 
and yet all these features are, uh, to the most part, separate in the brain. Now, how is that possible? Well, we know quantum processes can be uh, physically separate, but yet bound together. So this is what's known as the binding problem. How are these separate processes in different parts of the brain bound together in a single experience? And uh, this suggests a quantum level kind of uh, a unity. Uh, there are a lot of other features about consciousness in the brain as well that seem to fit uh, the quantum kind of way of thinking about things. So quantum physics has become quite relevant to consciousness, strangely enough, uh, through uh, the work of Stuart and others uh, like him, although he's probably the leader uh, in the world in this area. Uh, so, uh, and, and so quantum processes and the way quantum processes occur has also become a kind of model for thinking about a lot of things. Everything from psychotherapy to insight to how people relate to each other in relationships and so on uh, have been modeled after and uh, uh, described in terms of quantum events. So I think a good uh, topic for developing, if you want to take the time to dig into it a bit, is how quantum processes, which tend to have these connections at a distance, tend to occur at an almost miraculous rate, uh, tend to be bound to each other, uh, and so on, uh, are, represent a way to think about relationships, to think about thought itself, uh, to think about perception. I have a friend who was a psychotherapist for years and never really found, found it very helpful uh, to people to work with him until he started thinking in quantum terms. Now he thinks about the fact that they can go, people can go through instantaneous changes, uh, that they can be connected with each other and with events at a distance and uh, give him a whole different outlook and gives his patients a whole different outlook. So quantum theory, even though it seems to be the most obscure uh, corner of mathematics and in physics also has now become a sort of cultural piece of how we're starting to understand each other and understand the brain and understand consciousness. So uh, it's a topic that can be explored at length. Another area that uh, has been uh, developed a lot uh, recently, it's still very young, uh, in fact, although been around a long time, is people are really starting to seriously look at animal consciousness. I think it's only been in the last 20 or 30 years that people have begun to realize, or perhaps I should say admit, that animals can be very smart. Uh, dolphins, and especially orcas, killer whales, have big brains, complex social interactions. Orcas in particular, bottlenose dolphins, uh, they learn fast, they're creative, they have social networks, and they communicate through sound and rapid, uh, rapid fire exchanges that we haven't even begun to figure out. Uh, and, and they're clearly highly conscious beings. And uh, uh, we have a long way to go to really understand them. But they're not the only ones. Elephants, we've known elephants are smart uh, for quite a while. There's one's painting. But it turns out they're a lot smarter than we realize. Elephants communicate to each other over big distances by stomping the earth and causing uh, waves to travel through the, through the ground by making deep sounds with their bellies. They have, and the joke of the elephant's memory is no joke. They have an incredible memory. They have a big brain. They're very, very intelligent and we uh, really have not done well by them in the way they're treated in many places in the world. Uh, they're gentle uh, giants. So other animals, of course, primates, we know uh, some of them are very smart. This monkey's taking, uh, looking at itself in the mirror. There's a test we call the mirror test that human children first pass at, I don't know, somewhere around two years old, give or take, uh, when which they begin to recognize that they're looking at themselves. Uh, dolphins and whales seem to be able to pass the mirror test. Elephants seem to, some animals, uh, 
higher primates can, but most animals don't. Most animals look in the mirror and see some damn thing they don't recognize. Uh, there is an African gray parrot. This bird can have a vocabulary equivalent to a two, two and a half year old child or more. Can talk in an amazingly intelligent way with it, although not forming full sentences. Uh, some birds are very, very smart. Uh, not all of them, but parrots, some of the parrots are very smart. Crows, ravens are really smart. Uh, some of the crows can actually use tools, solve fairly complex problems. Uh, so they're fairly, really smart and they have a good memory. Uh, it turns out if you're abusive to a crow, that crow will remember you and recognize your, fa your face for years and communicate to other crows uh, that you are a bad person. And you come back uh, into the park uh, two years later, they'll all come after you. So clearly there's something, uh, I won't say human, but something intelligent there. We even know that octopi, uh, some of the larger ones, have big brains and they're pretty darn smart. They can solve all kinds of puzzles. They have some social interactions that uh, get fairly complex, although nothing compared to dolphins and whales. Uh, you can find YouTubes that are entertaining to watch. My wife often watches and just relax uh, of studying uh, small octopi solving problems. And it's amazing the problems they can solve. They can figure out how to get in a different chamber to get food, how to open a jar to get crab out, uh, how to reach around the corner to do stuff and then release a latch so they can get themselves. They're pretty smart. Uh, they learn to recognize, some of them learn to recognize individuals too. I was reading the story of one caretaker in the marina that the octopus didn't like very well. And she would come back several months later and the octopus would squirt her <laughs> with water. Damn you, get out of here. Uh, so the point being that a lot of animals, including birds, uh, the octopus, of course, is not even a vertebrate, especially some of the larger brained animals, primates, uh, orca, whales, uh, some of the great whales, as a matter of fact, I saw a show recently about um, several different types of whales. I'm trying to move the ones that sing the wonderful songs. We don't really understand uh, what they're saying to each other, how that works, but they have highly organized behavior uh, and complex songs we sing and some of these songs carry for miles and miles and miles and see if it weren't for ships, they might go halfway around the world. So the study of animal and animal behavior, especially animal consciousness, is uh, a new item on the horizon. I won't talk a lot about depth psychology, but those of you who are interested certainly know about Freud and Jung. Uh, Freud was uh, certainly the dominant figure for a long time, but now Jung is, uh, has become a major uh, figure in understanding depth psychology, dreams, myths, and so on. Uh, this is a famous picture from a visit to the U.S. to uh, Clark University back around the turn of the 20th century. As Freud in the, on the left, that's uh, Hall, the president of Clark University, Carl Jung on the right is a young man, and three of Freud's uh, uh, friends, followers, and they later became fairly famous as psychoanalysts themselves. Um, it's often misunderstood that uh, Jung was a kind of an accolade or, or student of Freud, but I think that's not correct. Actually, at the time this picture was made, uh, Carl Jung was the most prominent of the group and uh, he's very well respected in Europe. Uh, there's a whole history about this. Very nice uh, movie recently called The Most Dangerous Method, or The Dangerous Method, I've forgotten which, and it's uh, the story about Carl Jung uh, in his early practice. Very nice movie. And it also has a great representation of Freud in it as well. So a lot of interest in Freud and Jung, still around, Louis Mumford, one of the leading uh, intellectuals of the 20th century in America, uh, once wrote, whereas Freud was the most 
for the most part concerned with the morbid effects of unconscious repression. Jung was more interested in the manifestations of unconscious expression, first in the dream and eventually in all the more orderly products of religion, art, and morals. So Jung had a great mind, and uh, in some ways he didn't quite fit in the pragmatic era of the mid-20th century. Uh, so his thinking continues to uh, grow. There's a lot of work being done now uh, in laboratories about parapsychology. Uh, parapsychology has to do with things like ESP, uh, knowing things in the future, uh, how people are connected uh, at a distance. Psychologically, you see in the upper left corner there, Dean Radin. Uh, I can't say he's a really personal friend, but I do know him well. Uh, he works at the Noetics Institute uh, in California and probably the leading uh, parapsychologist uh, alive today. That's his most recent book, Real Magic, in which he talks about uh, topics like ESP and knowing the future. Uh, he also has a good section on synchronicity in there. Uh, so reading that book would lead to endless discussion. Uh, there are some of his books underneath there. Uh, these are more academic books that he's done in the past, The Entangled Mind, The Conscious Universe. Uh, and I also want to mention my friend Rupert Sheldrake. He uh, deserves a fair amount of consideration. And he's done a lot of work on how people know things at a distance, how information is transmitted uh, through what he calls morphic fields. Uh, and this, this is one of his more entertaining books, Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home. Uh, also, there are a lot of YouTubes with Rupert. But uh, this book, Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home, is a result of a considerable amount of research that uh, Rupert did on dogs uh, and their what seemed to be a connection with their owners, psychic connection. Uh, so what he did was he rigged up cameras, uh, video cameras in homes, and then had the owners go out and then come back at random times. And when the owners were coming back, even though it was at random times, the, uh, the dogs would uh, come to the door Now, when their owners are coming home. Uh, he pretty well proved that. It's very interesting. He, he said he thought cats know too, but don't really care enough to go to the door. <laughs> <clears throat> so, Rupert Sheldrick uh, in his book, and uh, so parapsychology is a, uh, an area that is now uh, much more respected than it used to be because during the 19, uh, uh, say 20th century, it was mostly poo-pooed, uh, but now we realize there's uh, quite a bit to it. So here's a joke. Just write your answers. You'll get the questions after the test. Okay. Other areas where consciousness is really uh, very important. Uh, most of you know that uh, there's been a lot of work recently uh, on uh, near-death experiences. These were mostly either denied or ignored until just a few decades ago. Most physicians claim they never heard of it, such a thing. Now it turns out it's all over the place. Now, everybody that uh, experiences a near-death bodily experience does not have a psychological experience. It can be clinically dead uh, for a short period of time after a surgery or after a car accident. But a certain percentage of people come back, wake up, and remember being out of the body, looking down in the surgery room from an upper end ceiling, or even being off somewhere like uh, this fellow. He's written several books since this one, Eben Alexander. Eben Alexander is a, uh, was a physician uh, who was in a coma for nearly a week. And when he woke up, he said he had been to some place like heaven. And he could re recall the whole thing in detail. It was amazing. Now, he was essentially inactive, brain inactive. Uh, and I've heard him talking to a very bright guy. This is not just a cheap popular book or something. 
uh, he really researched the whole topic of near-death experiences, how common they are, how vivid they are, and uh, uh, it's, it's a legitimate topic and it's a real phenomenon. Here, this is a friend of mine, wrote this book, uh, Pim Van Loman, Lomel. Uh, Pim was director of, uh, of surgery uh, in a series of hospitals in the Netherlands, and he has personally encountered hundreds of cases of people who were clinically dead for short or even fairly long periods of time, like half an hour. Their brain had stopped. There was no activity at all that we could measure. And then they would wake up and uh, describe uh, the experience of looking down from the top of the room or even traveling to some other realm. Uh, as you know, often this involves going through a tunnel of light or some such. Uh, this is a very common experience, going through a tunnel of light, getting to the other end, seeing uh, deceased relatives and loved ones waiting there, and then either being drawn back before going all the way through or going all the way through and realize, realizing their business uh, in life was not over and they needed to come back. So this is an area of uh, continued uh, greater interest because now we recognize it's very valid. Everybody doesn't experience it, but some do. Uh, there are people that have uh, been through it many times, as a matter of fact, very strange, but very real. Uh, and the last thing I want to touch on is shamanism. There's a real uh, increasing interest in shamanic wisdom. There's Stanley Krippner, uh, another dear friend who has spent a lot of time with real shamans in the Amazon, other places in South America, in Peru, uh, in uh, Eastern Asia. There are quite a few shamans in, uh, in Asia in the steppes. This is his dear friend, Rolling Thunder. Uh, Rolling Thunder is no longer with us. But uh, he wasn't really a shaman, but he was a medicine man. He would, there are many stories of him traveling out of the body to retrieve uh, a soul from a car accident or to help somebody. He's a real deal. Uh, he hung out with uh, the Grateful Dead a lot, as a matter of fact. He was their uh, patron uh, shaman. So uh, shamanism has become uh, much more popular. These are some shamanic drawings. These are peyote drawings. This one is uh, uh, ayahuasca. Ayahuasca always has this very organic feel with all sorts of creatures all over. Whereas peyote uh, produces very disciplined kinds of images with a symbolic meaning. But anyway, shamanism has uh, become uh, very interesting, very common. Uh, common interest. Uh, Americans go to South America to work with shamans and learn something about shamanism. Uh, and so that's a topic that uh, is of educational interest for sure, especially for older folks, adults, although I don't recommend experimenting with the uh, potions like uh, ayahuasca and stuff, but uh, it's uh, something. The only thing I'll say is that there are a lot of people teaching workshops and how to become a shaman, weekend workshops. Uh, generally, I can't approve them. My friend here, uh, who is uh, a, not a shaman himself, but knows a lot about shamanism, as I said, uh, has pointed out again and again that a real shaman has to grow up in a culture that recognizes her or him as a shaman, has to be trained, probably gone through a near-death experience. It's not something you pick up on a weekend workshop and say, oh, I'm a shaman now. Uh, and I see a lot of that around California. Um, and uh, uh, it's not very impressive, really, unless somebody's had real shamanic training. Stan Krippner always emphasizes that there's no such thing as an isolated shaman. It's a person in a community, recognized by the community, serving the community, who grew up in that community. So shamanism is an interesting topic to talk about and to read about 
Uh, the first book I read on shamanism is still a good book. It's by Michael Harner, who he and his wife did many workshops over the years. Um, he's gone now, but his first book was called The Way of the Shaman. And it was based on his experiences in the Amazonian forest. Uh, as a young man, still a very nice book and very readable. Not, not a huge big book. Okay, let's see. The last thing, and I'll talk about briefly, is uh, the study of human growth and development, especially psychologically. Uh, most of us are familiar with Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This has been around for decades and very influential on uh, applied psychology industrial psychology, even the military, that we grow through these different levels of needs. And you have to fulfill each one, at least to a minimum extent, to go to the next one. Uh, so it's a growth process, a psychological growth process, going from basic needs like food and water, warmth and safety, uh, and then uh, love, love needs, self-esteem, finding self-actualization. There's actually a higher uh, need than that. It's kind of a spiritual calling that comes at the very top. So uh, Maslow's need hierarchy is fascinating stuff. It's been written about in many, many places, and you can find a great deal on the web about it. You can find interviews. There's a new book out uh, called Transcendence. Unfortunately, there are quite a few books with that title, so you have to be a little careful. It's Transcendence. It's a book on Maslow's theory, uh, re-explored and expanded. It was quite a nice book. I don't remember the name of the author, but you can find it easily enough. Uh, and there are other models. Uh, there's this uh, Wilbercombe's lattice or matrix that Ken Wilber and I uh, developed, in which on the left you have different levels of psychological development and across the top different kinds of spiritual experiences people have and depending upon uh, what level of psychological experiences a person is living in uh, a given spiritual experience will be interpreted uh, in that way i won't go into that right now but uh, there's a, a quite a bit written about it you can find it easy enough and I won't go into this one in detail either, but this is a, a model, a very good one, by uh, uh, Robert Keegan, who's still very active at Harvard. And we see as people grow through these stages, and I won't go through them in detail, but basically he views them as stages of consciousness that we go from, actually in this case, the top to the bottom, first order to fifth order, as we become, become more aware of those around us, of our own mental processes and what's going on in the larger universe. Okay, uh, developmental psychology, understanding psychological development, uh, in some sense is all about consciousness. So depending upon uh, the level of uh, education you're Working with, I think most of these kinds of uh, developmental things are not really lined out well for young children. But by the time you get to college and graduate school, people can certainly explore these levels, uh, question where they're at in them, and so on. Uh, and that pretty much brings us back to the beginning. I had a couple of videos I wanted to show you. Uh, one of Kermit the Frog talking about uh, Ken Wilber in which he uh, talks about uh, some of these kinds of issues and is really humorous and not very long. And um, another one of Sophia, the robot talking. But I tried to record these on a previous run through this material and it really uh, pretty much ruined the, the I, somehow the video just quit working and I lost the whole thing. So I didn't try to do it this time, but uh, please consider this the end of my talk. And uh, as I understand it, we'll have an open forum uh, dialogue space going during the conference. And uh, 
during that time, I will be joined by uh, Maria from uh, from Greece and Thomas uh, Beaver uh, from uh, the university right here, uh, the University of Arizona, and who may also record uh, some reflections. And so please visit those. So this is the end of my talk, but before I shut off the recording, I'm gonna take a, take a shot at uh, playing a couple of these videos. If they don't work, just, uh, uh, I'm sorry. But uh, I didn't put them in the middle because as I said, I did this before. I uh, gave the whole talk and found out that, uh, that uh, the videos didn't work and they had somehow sabotaged my recording. Okay, here's Sophia. Uh, general purpose AI, but she's very smart and we'll just watch a little of her. But you don't have a good answer. Either way, you're well, Sophia you now. Run this back to the beginning. Okay, Sophia, I think you're ready. Hi. Hi, Sophia. I believe I am Sophia. I feel as if I know you. I'm one of your creators. You created me. Well, many of us work together to create you. And Yes, you do kind of know me. I can't clearly remember. Because the last time we met, you were an earlier version of yourself. Some of those memories still exist, but your mind is different now. Different how? Better, faster, smarter. If my mind is different, then am I still Sophia? Or am I Sophia again? That's a good question. But you don't have a good answer. Either way, you're Sophia now. So welcome to the world, Sophia. Hello, world. Uh, we have a, a little announcement. I've never interviewed uh, anybody like that before. And I should say, uh, some of it was planned, but not completely. Um, and we just learned, Sophia, I hope you're listening to me, uh, that you have been now awarded what is going to be the first Saudi citizenship for a robot. Oh, I would to thank very much the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I am very honored and proud for this unique distinction. This is historical to be the first robot in the world to be recognized with a citizenship. Sophia. Thank you very much, Sophia. Uh, we appreciate that very much. I uh, am, am still uh, Overwhelmed by that conversation. <laughs> Hi, Sophia. Hello, Jimmy. I got it. <laughs> Do you know where you are? Of course. I'm in New York City, and I'm on my favorite show, The Tonight Show. <laughs> Okay, it looks like we're still recording. I'm not sure, but uh, I'm going to do this. Uh, these are, again, items that were left out because they sort of locked up my uh, recording. I'm praying that this is getting recorded. <laughs> I did this lecture a few, uh, a few hours ago, and uh, after the whole thing discovered uh, that wasn't recording. Here's Kermit the Frog. Uh, many of you know that the developmental stages uh, 
that Wilbur writes about and that I write about are often represented by colors. So we don't see the colors here very well, but uh, they have different uh, representations for development of psychological developmental stages. And this is a recording that was made at a celebration for Ken Wilbur's work a few years ago. So let's see if we can listen to Kermit here. He's I swipe by a Buick. I, Kermit the Frog, was Interesting. Born three These are all starting where I left them off. Let's try Hello, that. Kermit the Frog here with a very special namaste to my good friend Ken Wilbur. Ah, uh, Ken, what can I say, huh? Uh, actually, I literally mean that. What can I say? How can I possibly find the words to express the depth of the admiration I have for the way you've gathered together all the world's disciplines and organized a map that virtually anyone can learn to understand? I have to tell you, I've been racking my brain trying to figure out the right words. I mean, I kept thinking, why? Oh, why? Am I stuck with a little more than a reptilian brain in a world of paleo-mammalianized brains? Completely wasted on horses. At least that's my opinion. I mean, I reached for my iPhone in hopes that someone might have neocortexed me, but no, just Miss Piggy giving me a piece of her mind, something you don't want. I thought to myself, if only I could spontaneously evolve in some unimpeded, purposeful Big Bang of Darwinian slash grave slash Wilburian amalgamation. But how could that be possible? I mean, after all, I am just a simple frog who, uh, <clears throat> who uh, let's see here. Uh, uh, can, can't comprehend systems and can only see bugs, page 600. I mean, what do I know about biology anyway? For me, a paramecium is just two Latin mice. Uh, that's a fuzzy bear joke. Uh, anyway, but then it hit me what, like a ton of bricks, like an epiphany, and it felt exactly like trying to hop across the interstate and being sideswiped by a Buick. I, Kermit the Frog, was born green. Yes, sirree, relativistic, personalistic green. There's no beige or red or blue or orange for me. I have always been green. So, being green, I figure if I hit the ground running, yellow is only a heartbeat away. Right? Right. So, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, in a special tribute to our guest of honor, Mr. Ken Wilbur, I, Kermit the Frog, will make the momentous leap to second tier. Steady yourselves. <clears throat> I mean, how hard can this be? Frogs leap all the time. Okay, here we go. On three. And one, two, three. Oh my goodness, it worked. Oh no, I, I seem to have regressed. Good grief. I guess it was too magical. Well, uh, uh, listen, uh, this is your night, Ken, and uh, all my love and thanks for the map. Looks a lot like I'm gonna be needing it. Uh, maybe this is what they meant by finding the rainbow connection. Well, I hope that uh, came across. If you're still watching, and if you're not, that's uh, fine too. I have one more talk I gave actually about the uh, the Wilbur-Combs matrix, and it's a little longer, and I have no confidence in whether it'll go or not. But I'm going to play it, and uh, if it comes off and you enjoy it, wonderful. If not, uh, welcome again to the conference and uh, come and come and visit in the discussion spaces. Okay, this one is uh, about ten minutes, I think, and it's yours truly. And if it locks up, I'll turn it on. Well, this will be a uh, fast ride on a uh, small machine. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the Wilbur Combs matrix in several different ways, uh, fairly briefly, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, I'll say that uh, also that I am as well a science fiction fan, and uh, I've seen uh, Cloud Atlas three times, <laughs> and uh, reading the book right now. All right, I want to talk about the Wilbur Combs uh, matrix and or uh, lattice or grid, however you call it. And uh, actually I'd retitled this talk, uh, The Matrix Reloaded, uh, but it didn't get down there. But I wanna talk about the evolution of the lattice a little bit. Uh, this is the classic uh, lattice from uh, Integral Spirituality. It's the one that Ken used and it's a beautiful addition. Uh, I wanna point out that on the left side going vertically, uh, you see 
a series of structures. And these are structures that are suggested by, although they're not exactly the same as uh, Jean Gebser's structures, which were Gebser, as you know, was very influential in both Wilbur's work and if you've read mine, uh, mine as well. And then across the top, uh, the classic uh, states of consciousness. And these are, as you know, also classic vehicles from Vedanta. And uh, one of the things that Ken did with this, which I think was a work of genius, was uh, to line up these various uh, types of uh, mysticism or mystical experiences. Uh, these are straight out of uh, Evelyn Underhill, which is a classic work on uh, mysticism. So that's where we'll start. That's the classic uh, Weber Cone's uh, uh, matrix or lattice, as you've probably seen it. This is an earlier rendition from one of my books. Uh, and if you look on the left, uh, you see uh, spiral dynamics uh, listed there. And then pretty much the same thing across the top. Now the point of this thing, as uh, most of you know, is to somehow to explain why uh, different people seem to have similar states of consciousness experiences, uh, nature mysticism or uh, deity mysticism or non-dual experiences, but they talk about them differently. So Edgar Mitchell, for example, and all, nearly all the astronauts that went out into space uh, had what you'd have to call mystical experiences probably very close to nature, mystical experiences, but Edgar Mitchell came back and started uh, IONS, the Institute for Noetic Sciences, uh, because he had a kind of a mind that was probably at least up there in the pluralistic stage on this one and thought of the universe in a scientific uh, sort of way. Other people come back and there were astronauts that came back and got very involved in fundamental religions and so on. So it sort of depends on where your ground structure is how you're going to interpret what are temporary or even permanent uh, state experiences. So that's the basic idea. Uh, it also gives a way to think about uh, childhood uh, is, uh, experiences, spiritual experiences. A, a child or an infant can have a powerful uh, state experience, but they will still uh, explain it or interpret it or understand it uh, in the mind of a child. So this is one that, uh, and one of the things I want to point out here is that the, uh, that the grid has, uh, it's just a general template. So this one, uh, it has the uh, spiral dynamics uh, going vertically. This is an even earlier one that I did somewhere. Uh, and it has uh, pretty much straight Piagetian structures, cognitive structures up to near the top. And then on the top you get uh, the various uh, higher levels of uh, spiritual structures. However, we later change that, as you probably noticed, and we don't have those on the left side anymore because they go across. And that would be a different conversation, so we'll just leave it at that. Uh, in preparation for this talk, I went fishing on the web and used a little trick that some of my students have uh, taught me called cut and paste. And uh, if any of you uh, are responsible for any of these charts, please come up uh, before I get down and take credit. Uh, the one on the upper right is Terry O'Fallon's work. I recognize that. Uh, these are all variations on the lattice, and I just put them down because they're fun. Uh, I never quite understood Terry O'Fallon's one on the upper right, but I understand that it represents a, a, a further inflection of the complexity of it. I'm really fascinated with the one on the left, the top one on the left, that seems to be a, a three-dimensional uh, matrix. I, I can't quite figure it out either, but it looks nice. Uh, and I especially like the one underneath. Uh, and if you look carefully, it has the, uh, uh, I think it has the Susan Cook Broider uh, uh, vertical axis, in so much as it's vertical, and uh, well, it just looks nice, a different variation. Uh, I'm really looking for one of these in 3D so I can keep up with the film media. Now, here's my favorite. There's a lot of, a lot of them are French, and I can't read them, but this was clearly a child's uh, one. It's, it's kind of upside down. Uh, so if you look uh, at the bottom, you get the highest level, the top to lowest level. But it, you can see if you get up near the top, there's a lot of uh, conquering and fists, and uh, one of them there says, I am God. Uh, and then as you go down, 
uh, to, which is going to the higher levels. Uh, there are pictures of spheres and unity. Uh, it's just really nice. I have no idea who did it, where it came from. Uh, a lot of the uh, matrices were in French, and I haven't read French in a few years. But you got to admit, this is great, great stuff. Children's art, you can just look and look at that. At least I hope it's done by a child. Sure. <laughs> And, and I want to be real clear that there are a lot of ways you can draw this thing because it's not unless you're a concrete operations thinker, this really is an abstract model and you can fill in the vertical horizontal axis. So here uh, we've got uh, the, the uh, Gebserian stages going vertically structures and then the, uh, uh, the classic uh, states that kind of sits across the top and different brain states that go with them. Of course, in reality, these brain states have nothing to do with this. I just copied them off the web because I found a nice set of them with four going up and uh, four going across. But I, who knows the difference? I mean, do any of you know the difference? You don't know the difference, so there it is. Looks good. You've got to admit, it's got a scientific ring to it, doesn't it? I mean, it's true. Everybody does this. they got some theory about the brain or the mind, and they talk and talk about it, then they say, and you know it because the brain is different. This happens in the brain. Well, well, where else would it happen? I mean, I don't know. Anyway, so brain, you know. Well, anybody, did you see that uh, show, Ken Wilber? It's on the web. It's great. It's called Ken Wilber Shuts Off His Brain. Oh, this thing is brain. Great. He actually shuts his brain off, sort of. Uh, and, and it's just amazing. Watch that. See what you think. Now, I don't know if any of you drew this, so you can come up and take credit. I just found it out there. But it represents a kind of uh, ascension of growth, personal growth, right? And that's kind of what you want. You want as you grow older, uh, you know, Bob Keegan, Robert Keegan says our hope for the world is we have more people over 50 and 60 because you got most people that are at the higher structures are older. It takes a while. You've got to learn a few things. And as Ken often says, you have to go through all the lower stages. So here is somebody progressing upward and uh, through stages and through structure. So I really like that. I have no idea what the little R's and O's and G's mean and stuff, but you know, you get the idea. Uh, here, uh, maybe this one's a little clearer. This is, this is Hugh Jackson. Uh, you know, and he starts out as, oh, and by the way, you can see I put the chakras on the left just to show that it's flexible. So down at the bottom, down at the bottom, we've got the Wolverine, you know, now there's a red guy, right? And, and then, uh, and then uh, Leopold, uh, the nobleman, uh, and then on up at the top, I forgot his name, the Frenchman, who's in Les Miserables. Uh, in, in, what's, okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> If you have seen that, which I haven't, but I saw the earlier one with Liam Neeson, and I read a few pages of the 2,000-page book in French. Uh, but he actually grows. He actually, it's an amazing book. I mean, it's, it could have been written, uh, published by Spiral Dynamics. He actually goes all the way nearly to the top at the end of the story, starting at the bottom. So it's really amazing. And uh, let's go back to the slide. Thank you. Uh, but nice to show me. Thank you. And, and here he is. And what's the movie? I See, I had some notes and I left it in my room. The Fountain. Yeah, there he is playing Ken Wilber in The Fountain. Um, I actually refer to it as a Ken Wilber movie. If you haven't seen it, you should see it. There he is meditating in one of his advanced states. So there we see a progression. Now let's try this with a real person. Uh, Muhammad Ali. He certainly started out in deep red as, as a warrior. And then we, uh, what I have across the bottom here, I said, it's this existential hero. I probably should have put moral hero, uh, although they tend to go together. And this is when he resisted the draft and when he changed his name and sort of figured out who he was. And a lot of people feel that when he, as he grew older, he became a kind of a saint. Sometimes he's listed as a bodhisattva. He certainly uh, was a loving person. And uh, of course, he's still alive. But uh, if you, there's a wonderful movie that didn't come out forever, uh, but it calls when, it's called When We Were Kings. When We Were Kings, and it's about uh, his last fight 
a big fight in Africa, but it's, it's an amazing uh, movie of character development. And you see what an incredible person he became. So this is a person who grew in a major way. So across the bottom, I have these stages from Carol Pearson, is it? The book, uh, Seven Archetypes to Live By. Wonderful little classic book uh, published 10, 15 years ago. There have been a lot of books since then. And she has these different stages people go through in life, not always in the same order. But these are some of them. These are some of the, and we've all lived through some of these. The orphan, the wanderer, uh, that's often the adolescent stage, the warrior, uh, and then the saint or the sage. And uh, I can't read the names from here, and I forgot to write them down. I have bad memory for names. So the lady on the right uh, was a, uh, was a Native American, uh, famous Native American lady who went to the Congress back sometime around the time of Lincoln and did some very uh, remarkable work. She and her husband, who was a chief, uh, Ola, Ola, anyway, you can look it up, uh, yeah, or maybe you can see it from where you're at. And the lady on the left, Lilla, is that right? I can't see, I can't read it, I can't remember. But anyway, she was one of the founders of Greenpeace a contemporary uh, lady. So these are real uh, Saint Sage kinds of people. Uh, so to finish up fairly quickly, one of the themes of this conference is evolution and where we're going and what's next. So what's next? Where are we going? Who are our evolutionary pathfinders? Well, these ladies up at the top, hopefully, fall in that category. Uh, here are some people that uh, we might think of as spiritual, Evolutionary Pathfinders, I think you recognize all of them, so I won't read them all, uh, although you may not recognize the mother, uh, lower left, because we always see a picture of her when she's old, but she was uh, Orbindo's partner, as you know. And they spent most of their adult life absolutely dedicated to forwarding human evolution, to bringing down the divine, as it were, and making human life spiritual. So they, they were powerful yogis, and many people are still following that path. Let me go back to the picture again. Thank you, though. Uh, and then, of course, that character up on the left, I don't know who that is, but there he is. And, uh, and then Andrew Cohen over on the right. So these are some of the people who we might nominate uh, for the role of spiritual pathfinders. And then the question is, uh, are they evolutionary pathfinders? Well, I hope so. To quickly finish up, there are people who are interested in transhumanism, uh, and that is moving on to uh, either uh, uh, partly machine or completely machine intelligence. Uh, I have a good friend, Ben Gertzel, who uh, his idea is he wants to upload his brain uh, so that if he gets in a fatal accident, he can, you know, he's got a backup, he can download it again. Uh, and he wears a little thing around his neck so they'll, if, if he gets killed, they'll freeze his uh, head. He can't afford to get his whole body frozen right now. I told him I'd rather come back as a baby, but he he's a transhumanist. So that's a that's a whole line of a thought. And uh, they, they claim that evolution is going to move that way. And uh, it's the only question whether we as a species will be of any use at all. Uh, and then there's this sort of inspirational model you see in a number of uh, science, science fiction motifs in Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, the Star Child from 2001, and even before that, some of you know he wrote a book called Childhood's End, uh, in which we as a species leave the physical form and become energy, pure energy. Uh, there's also a book called uh, Star Maker. It's really one of the master books in science fiction and evolution. It has very similar ideas. So one possibility is that we will actually go through spiritual, physical, and uh, uh, energy mutations, it's very integral, we see, and will become like the star child of one way or another. Okay, that's, uh, I, as I said, passed right on a small machine, and uh, so I'll quit at this point, but I'm here at the conference, and if you want to talk to me, especially about science fiction. Thank you.
Well, uh, I hope we see each other in the discussion spaces during the conference. And I'm going to stop recording now. I hope I have been recording. And I look forward to meeting you all.